What's up everybody, welcome back to the Nintendo Social Club. Now, it's officially been a week since the Switch has launched and I thought now would be a perfect time to talk about my experience with the console and its games while still in the honeymoon phase. But before we get into that, let's get into the news. First thing we have here is the Nintendo Switch sales. Now, according to New York Times reporter, the first 48 hours, the Nintendo Switch has been the best-selling console for Nintendo in its history. Yes, that includes the Wii, the 3DS, and everything else you could think of. It was also reported that Breath of the Wild is Nintendo's fastest-selling standalone game. Now, this excludes things like Wii Sports and Super Mario Bros. as those were packed in, but it does include things like Super Mario 64, Mario Kart, and Smash Bros. To me, this says Nintendo's off to a great start. Now, they basically sold through everything on a random Friday in March, so if they can continue this throughout the year, leading into the holiday season, it really bodes well for Nintendo and the Switch and where it's going to be in a few years. Now, they really did set themselves up for this. They do have a whole bunch of major titles coming out over the next few months. Um, we're going to have ARMS. Uh, Super Mario Odyssey, Splatoon 2, Mario Kart 8 is coming out next month. So I'm sure there's going to be other games in between those, but they do have major experiences for us throughout the year. And I'm sure they're going to kind of ship out more consoles with each one of those releases so that people who don't have the console can buy one. And it seems like they've been doing a lot better since like the Wii or the NES Classic or even with the Amiibos, which were in short supply and did not meet demand anywhere near where it really was. That really leads me into our next topic, which is Amiibos. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild does support all of the previous Zelda Amiibos, including the ones in the Smash Brothers line, um, the 30th anniversary ones that just came out over the past holiday season, and the, the new Breath of the Wild ones. Now, let me say this. I've seen the 30th anniversary ones warming shelves for the past few months. Now, my Toys R Us, if you've seen actually in my Switch Midnight release video, there's the part where I'm looking for the Guardian Amiibo because that was really the only one I wanted from the launch. Um, you can take a look and there was tons of the 30th anniversary ones lining the shelves. And I'll put that clip in here just so you can see. Now, I went there today and all of them were gone. Now, the only thing they had was a few of the Breath of the Wild ones and the 8-bit link. So the Ocarina of Time link, the uh, the two-pack with uh, Toon Link and Zelda was gone. Um, any of the original Smash line was gone, so there was no Zeldas, no Links, uh, no Ganondorf, nothing like that, which I think those have been kind of out of print for a while. I don't recall seeing them uh, recently, but I was surprised to go check it out for myself and saw that they were completely sold out, and if you check eBay now, these things are going for upwards of $50, so it looks like Amiibo scalping is back because uh, Breath of the Wild has renewed interest in Amiibos, apparently. All right, so next up on the list, we have uh, some new eShop games. Now, this past Thursday, March 9th, was supposed to be the release of Blaster Master Zero on the eShop. Uh, aside from that, Neo Geo also dumped a whole bunch of their classic arcade games like King of Fighters 98, Metal Slug 3, and a couple other ones that I'll list here. I mean, this is really really surprising uh it's not part of the virtual console per se um so virtual console still hasn't been released announced or anything like that these are just some older games that neo geo also i believe have ported to like ps4 and stuff like that and it's pretty cool especially if you're into these kind of games um, i'm going to be picking up metal slug 3 and possibly king of fighters i'm not sure uh, if I really want to go with King of Fighters because um, Street Fighter is coming out and then Pocket Fighters is coming out. So I'm not sure if I need like a third fighting game. But for $7.99, it's really not that much. Uh, a lot of people are complaining that these are just old games and they're overpriced. But you don't have to buy them. I mean, no one's forcing you to buy these games. So you can just ignore it and go on with your life and play Zelda or whatever else you want to play. So next up, Reggie's been on sort of like a PR tour making the rounds at you know, all the magazines or news stations and stuff like that. And uh, there was an interview with Time, and there was another interview that was like a video on YouTube. I forget uh, who the interview was with, but he kind of revealed some interesting information with the with the problems with the console people were having. So uh, he basically said Nintendo is aware of the problems that people are saying they're having with the Joy-Con desyncing, and also the problems with the dock scratching the screen. Um, they also said that they haven't gotten too many reports, so uh, instead of complaining online, he said basically just contact Nintendo if you have a problem with anything. That way they can see how widespread of an issue it is. Um, if you're not contacting Nintendo, they're basically going to say, well, 
no one's complaining, so this must not be that big of a problem. Um, and if it is a problem for you, I would say contact Nintendo, let them know. So basically, he also said that during the Switch preview events, they really didn't have any of those problems. So, I mean, you did have people coming in and out, undocking and docking the Switch. You had people playing with the, with the Joy-Con in an area with probably a lot of cell phone interference and uh, different variables and stuff like that. And they said, personally, they haven't had any issues with anything like that. So if I were you and you're having a problem with your Switch, let Nintendo know, let them know there's a problem. That way this can be fixed in the future and that it can be recognized as a legitimate problem. Now he also kind of speculated on some of the future of the Switch and some of the titles that'll be coming to it. So basically said games like Super Smash Brothers, Metroid, Animal Crossing are on their way for the Switch, but they have nothing to announce. I forget exactly what he said, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said they like to have one game from each franchise for each console generation. And when you talk about a game like Metroid, this is a game that's critically acclaimed by people who love the series, but it's also a game that hasn't typically sold very well when you compare it to other franchises that Nintendo has. And I think that poses a real problem for them when you combine it with the fact that the Wii U was another console didn't really sell too well. I think they did 13.5 or something million, um, which really isn't that much and it was considered a commercial failure. So you have a game that typically doesn't sell that great. You have a game that's gonna cost a lot of money to make, a lot of time to make, and you have a console that not a lot of people have in their homes. When I look at it as a, from a business standpoint, I probably wouldn't release a game like Metroid on the Wii U either. And that's probably why they ported a version of Breath of the Wild over to the Switch. Now, I believe this game has been ready on the Wii U for probably some time. And really, they were just only delaying it because of the Switch and they wanted to release it simultaneously. Um, and it really is the smart move because look at the kind of response it's got from people. Uh, Breath of the Wild is, like I said earlier, the, the number one selling Nintendo game um, at launch. And... You know, it's been doing very well for them, and it's got them a lot of hype, a lot of a lot of great press and reviews, and I mean, it's really undeniable that their plan is sort of working out for the time being. So, um, say what you will about Nintendo, they do things their way, which sometimes can be to a fault, but times like this, it really does work out, and if you really try and look at it from a business standpoint rather than from like a gamer standpoint, um, a lot of this stuff does make sense, and I believe that that Nintendo's working on a Metroid game as we speak, and I believe they have been working on it for a while, because if you really think about it, what has Retro Studios done lately? I believe Tropical Freeze was their last game, if I'm not mistaken, and that's been a couple years, so they have to be working on something, and what else would it be if it wasn't Metroid? Now, so, I'd expect Metroid to be coming, I definitely expect Smash to be coming without a doubt. It's probably going to be... A version of the one for the Wii U, uh, probably with upgraded graphics, frame rate, all the DLC, hopefully a couple more characters and new levels and stuff like that. Something, a little incentive for us to buy it a third time because most of us who are big fans of Smash bought it for the 3DS and then the Wii U. So hopefully we'll see those soon and something to look forward to, especially at things like E3 and the random times where Nintendo just comes out with a direct and announces a whole bunch of games and stuff that'll be coming out. Now some interesting news actually came out today about the Switch possibly being hacked and supposedly it grants them some some kind of access to possibly run on signed code which would mean homebrew uh, games, homebrew apps and stuff like that on the Switch and possibly lead to something like kernel access and unfortunately it might lead to rampant piracy. Now when you look at a console very similar to the Switch and the PSP uh, this is something that sold very well, but the software sales did not do very well. It's because this console was hacked wide open, and pretty much anybody who owned a PSP, especially anybody I know, uh, had a PSP, and their PSP was hacked. They had all the emulators on it, and they were running all the PSP games for free right off of the right off the card. So hopefully Nintendo, for their own sake, responds in the proper way and kind of gets this uh, back door closed up, and hopefully you know, prevents this kind of thing from happening in the future. And with that, we're all done with the news and we're getting into our main topic. So it's officially been one week with the Switch. Um, I picked mine up in a midnight release at Best Buy, of course, uh, as you guys may already know from my midnight release video. And honestly, I've been having 
an amazing time with the console. Now, the console itself, I'm going to start there. The concept of the console, how it works, uh, it's like 90% perfect. There's a few things about it that kind of bother me. Uh, not big deals at all, just very small issues. Um, the main one, if you saw my unboxing, you know the main one's probably going to be the the rails for the Joy-Con or the straps for the Joy-Con. Um, they're not as smooth as I'd like them to be. And, I mean, it's not a real problem because I don't really use them too much. But I was kind of hoping that everything would be a little bit smoother. But the whole thing with docking and keeping my console charged, I've never had a point where my console died. Never had a point where my Joy-Cons died. I never had a point where my Pro Controller died. It's just everything's been... And I put it on the dock, you know, when I go to bed and I take it off. I bring my system to work with me every day. Um, I play it on my lunch break. I play it whenever I have a chance. Never had a problem with, with the battery dying or anything like that. And I've mostly been playing, you know, Zelda. So um, it's just really been great, especially when, you know, I have to go do something and I'm not driving. I could just bring, just pop the system off and just continue the game with me when I leave. Um... The first day I got it, it was Friday. I bought it with me to work. I showed some of my co-workers. We played 1-2 Switch. That was really fun. Then I kind of showed off Zelda. And I really showed off like how the system works with the Joy-Con sliding off and sliding them into the Joy-Con grip and uh, everything like that. And everybody at work who's seen it wants one now. So I have people who really aren't even gamers and stuff like that, who, who are into the into games and stuff like that, but not really classified as like a gamer per se um everybody has been blown away they like the main reaction is always like wow that's really cool and a lot of times they're saying they want to get one so it's it's really speaks well to the console and its concept um people see it they understand it they they get what it does and they get the possibilities of it um like right away unlike the wii u which really nintendo came out with mixed messaging with the wii u and People didn't know it was a new console, and really the whole thing was very convoluted, and a lot of the stuff they showed off as a concept never even made it to, to the market, so, you know, the Switch was, was very, the way they did it is, is very tight. I mean, they had a proof of concept, they had a plan with marketing, and kind of it all came together to be clear and concise and instantly let people know this is a new piece of hardware, this is what it can do. Uh, and most people really do think it's really very cool, even people who aren't gamers. Also, a few days after release, I think this was like Tuesday, one of my friends came over. Um, I just really wanted to show it to him really quick, and we ended up having a lot of fun. We played 1-2 Switch probably for like an hour, um, just just playing the quick draw game, the samurai game, really a lot of the games, and we had so much fun, we were just laughing and just falling all over the place. Um, and I showed him Zelda and stuff like that. It's another person who doesn't really, you know, he has a PS3. So that tells you everything about that. And he really uses it mainly to watch, you know, Netflix and stuff like that. So this is somebody who's not really a gamer. Somebody who, who's always played video games and stuff like that throughout his life. But never, you know, completely into it like somebody like me or maybe yourself. And, you know, we had a lot of fun playing a game like 1-2 Switch. So I think I, even just in that that moment there they'd already feel like it's worth the thirty dollars that i paid for it because i did have the 20 percent off uh at best buy and then i had some rewards i think like ten dollars in rewards so for me it came out to 29.99 and so far it's really been worth it because it's just the kind of game you can show people it doesn't take time to kind of set up it doesn't take time to play they're very quick uh, like frenetic multiplayer games you can just play a match or two just like wow that's really cool move on to the next thing and kind of show all the kind of thing that the system can do. So it's really a great way to show up the system. It's really a shame that it wasn't included, but you know, what can you do about it? Uh, moving on, I had a chance to actually play it on public transportation recently. Um, last Saturday, or Sunday rather, there was the Nintendo Switch meetup at Rockefeller Plaza. Uh, this was held by C&D and Triforce, who were the first people to get the Nintendo Switch at the Nintendo New York store. I think he waited like 30 days outside the store and everything like that. And it was, the whole thing's chronicled on YouTube. And it's, I thought it was really very interesting. At first I thought it was a little bit crazy. I never really uh, knew of 
of C and D before this whole thing started. And when I started watching them, I was like, ah, oh, this is kind of weird. Like, what are we doing? But the way kind of everything turned out with like the whole Nintendo community kind of rallying around him and every day having like a whole mess of people outside playing games and just having crazy adventures and talking Nintendo, I mean, really was like a very cool experience, something that I personally have never seen before. I mean, I've always go to midnight releases in my neighborhood and it's always just a line of people tired and bored just wanting to get their game and go home. Um, this was something different. This is people coming from all around the country come to show their support maybe give out stuff but anyway they had a, a switch meetup sunday and i live on long island so it's maybe like an hour and a half train ride into the city and i was i bought my switch with me of course as a switch meetup and i was on the train playing zelda like a full console game on a train into the city just in another world just to have something like that with you anywhere you go anytime is just really incredible and a, Really look forward to some more of the experiences Nintendo's going to be giving us with the Switch. I'm going to get into some of the games. and I'm going to start with Zelda. And this is the main game of, of the launch, of course. And I have to say, the game really is incredible. I put maybe 15, 20 hours into it so far. And I haven't looked up anything online. No guides, no spoilers, nothing like that. i just really been wandering around. And at first... It was kind of disorienting. I'm so used to modern games holding your hand, explaining every little minute thing to you, like, go here, do this, this is what you have to do. I mean, this game really just tells you you have to find the shrines, and, and that's it. It doesn't tell you where the shrines are. It kind of gives you an idea that you could use the Sheikah Slate to, to find them. I, at the time, had no idea what that even meant. Um, I tried looking on the map and, and stuff like that. I didn't understand that you're supposed to use the feature where you zoom in like you want to get up to basically a high point and then you use the Sheikah Slate to zoom in and you can kind of pinpoint things with the with the Sheikah Slate and then use your map to kind of cross-reference where you have to go and stuff like that and one of the coolest moments and the moment where the game really clicked for me because before that I was kind of just wandering around like not really sure what I should be doing or not really sure if what I was doing was correct or whatever but um, there was a point where I found basically a cold climate area, and this is all on the Great Plateau, of course. So before I had the wind glider, before I found uh, any of the additional shrines or anything like that. Basically, I wandered into this cold area, and I started shivering, and I got really cold, and I didn't die, but I had the like the thing where you start flashing, and you have to, I think, either eat something or something like that to bring your, your health back to normal. So I actually found these... Uh, I think they're like hot peppers. So I made a dish, and this is really like one of the first things I've ever cooked in the game. So I was just eating like apples and stuff to keep my health up because I haven't really had too many problems with combat and stuff like that previously. So I made this thing where it gives you the cold resistance. And I had, I think, maybe 10 minutes of cold resistance, and I just wandered into this area where it's like, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm wearing like the original clothes that you get from the beginning of the game that have zero resistance to cold temperature. And I, I wandered up to like the top of this mountain and on the top of the mountain I found the old man who's obviously following you around and he starts explaining to you like wow you're not supposed to be out here and he gives you like a like a new shirt that actually gives you the resistance and I thought that was like super interesting like I kind of just was trying to push the limits of the game at the time just trying to see how far I can make it and and it's crazy that like when I got there there was something there waiting for me and then after that, I took a look around and I found, you know, my first shrine. I was like, wow, okay, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be hunting down the, the shrines and stuff like that. And it kind of all clicked together for me at that point. And at that point, I, like, absolutely just fell, like, in love with, like, how the game was was given to us. Which was, like, here's an open world. Explore the open world. Um, you can go to these areas if you want, but you're probably going to die. And that's really what, where I'm at now. I think I was, like, in the Gruno Desert and stuff like that. And... I have only like three or four hearts and I'm just wandering through these areas where I have to literally sneak around around all the enemies because the, if they see me they'll one shot kill me even like the little bats and stuff like that so it's really cool like the sense of exploration and kind of open endedness where they kind of just let you do whatever you want and uh, at your own risk and it's very cool it's a game I plan to play in its entirety like that I don't want to see anything with any guides or really any way to beat the shrines i think there's like 120 shrines and it's a lot of a lot of content i mean packed into this game so if you have a switch and you don't have breath of the wild just obviously go buy that game because 
the reason for owning the Switch and probably one of the best games I've played in a very, very long time. And I've played a lot of good games lately. A lot of good games. 1-2 Switch, of course, like I spoke on before, it's a perfect game for playing when you have, you know, a couple people in a room, might be drinking a few beers. And if you have people who are open-minded and open to playing the game and open to embarrassing themselves, then it could be a lot of fun because some people I've noticed are kind of like very reserved about it. Uh, or embarrassed to kind of play the game or act act out kind of like the scenes and stuff like that where you know you're doing the quick draw and you know you're playing like a cowboy and stuff like that where some people are just awkward and like feel like they're being judged so I mean if you have people who are, who are open-minded to games like this then it's definitely something you should pick up I mean if, if you're the type of person who plays single-player games and stuff like that then you know you can pass on this one because I'm sure there'll be plenty of other games and then of course we have snipper clips which is probably one of the most fun co-op games I've played in a really long time especially couch co-op it's kind of the thing we don't really have anymore um, it's something I really miss especially with ps4 there's all these really cool uh, like indie games and smaller titles like that and like the multiplayer is always online like there's no split screen there's no co-op mode couch co-op modes or anything like that and it's really something like as it as the past few years have been going on, it's something I've actually missed, and it's something that I know I've been missing. And when I saw the Nintendo Switch and the fact that you know it comes with two controllers out of the box, and that's going to encourage developers to include couch co-op and and couch co-op and also competitive modes where you can play against each other, play with each other, and built in right into the game. And that's really what Nintendo is always have been about: is you know playing with somebody right next to you and having fun having a good time and that's always what Nintendo's been about it hasn't been about realism has never been about power they've always been about innovation and hardware and it's always been about couch co-op and having fun with your friends now fast rmx is another eShop game it's only 19.99 um it's a futuristic racing game of course it's very similar to like f-zero or wipeout but it does have this very very cool like game gameplay mechanic in that it has like a phase switching so there's like an orange and a blue phase and on the track there's kind of like the boost points or like these ramps that kind of will jump up and they'll either be colored blue or orange and you have to switch your phase from blue to orange to make sure when you're going through these gates or you're going through these boost pads that you know you're matching up with the phase so that it's actually going to give you the boost and if you don't if say if you go over the blue and you're switched in the orange phase this actually slows you down so adds a great layer of like strategy to just what would be a normal racing game and it's kind of reminds me of uh, Ikaruga on the GameCube which was like a shooting shooting game but also had a similar thing where you had to switch through you know the different phases stuff like that so it's really like Wipeout, F-Zero and Ikaruga all mixed up into one and for 20 bucks there's I think like 30 tracks and a whole bunch of cars so it's definitely worth the price of admission I definitely check that out if you were into any kind of racing game like that even with Mario Kart coming up it's like a different style of game so I wouldn't be worried too much about having, you know, two racing games or anything like that. The last one we're going to talk about is Blaster Master Zero. Now, I'm not sure if you know, but I'm a huge fan of Blaster Master. This goes back to the NES days when I was a little kid. Um, I even had the the World of Nintendo, like, Choose Your Own Adventure Blaster Master book, which was, at the time, was my, my favorite book. I've read it so many times, and I actually wish I still had it. I might go on eBay and pick one up, but, you know, when I saw this was announced, I literally flipped out, like, I'm so excited to have a proper sequel to Blaster Master because Blaster Master 2 on the Sega Genesis was an okay game, but it wasn't Blaster Master. It was Blaster Master name, basically, only. And I mean, this game is just like the original. It looks like it, sounds like it, it plays like it. The way it kind of works is kind of like a, a Metroidvania in the way that the map is laid out with the grid, and it definitely uh, encourages exploration, finding new weapons and stuff like that, and abilities that can get you into new areas. Um, What's cool about it is you start in in your vehicle and you're able to exit the vehicle. So you can be either be on foot or in a vehicle. And that's for the side scrolling parts of the game. Now you come across basically these doorways and when you go through the doorway it switches to like a top down almost isometric view of the game where you're more zoomed in. And that's kind of like a whole different vibe to the game. It's like almost like two games in one. So when you get to the end of a lot of these areas there's like a boss and then the boss gives you like a new ability which allow you to get to new areas and stuff like that so if you're into games like metroid castlevania all these 
uh, open exploration 2D side scrolling games, definitely check out Blaster Master Zero because it's a really a great game and a game I'd really recommend to anybody who likes that style of game. So that's about all the time we have for this episode. I just want to thank you guys again for checking out the Nintendo Social Club and until next time, peace.